Hello and welcome to Beyond the Office Visit, Part 2, Functional Wellness and Nutrition. Today's webinar is a part of our series, the Beyond the Office Visit series, that focuses on topics that go beyond diagnosis and questions related to the disease and into other areas of interest that you have shared with us as most important to you. We're really excited to focus on wellness and nutrition today and hope you get a lot out of the webinar. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This meeting is for informational purposes only and is not a medical consultation. Before making any changes to your diet or your nutrition, we encourage you to speak with your medical team about your specific circumstances. The webinar is being recorded and will be sent out as soon as possible. Due to time constraints, we may not be able to answer all questions, but we'll follow up with additional information wherever possible. And if you're tuning into the recording, we encourage you to reach out to the organizations that are your co-hosts, and we can provide additional information if you'd like. You can use the Q&A feature in your webinar panel to submit questions. Typing in your question will submit it. I also encourage you to check to see if someone else has already asked a similar question. And if so, you can upvote that question by clicking the thumbs up button. It will show the panelists the most popular questions first. For any technical help, please use the chat window. You can reach out to Histiocytosis Association in the chat window or by email at outreach at histio.org and we will try to help troubleshoot with you. Today's co-hosts are the Erdheim Chester Disease Global Alliance, the Histiocytosis Association, and the Histiocytosis Association of Canada. All three organizations are partnering together for the good of the histio community. Today on the call, we have Jessica Corcoran, Executive Director of the ECD Global Alliance, which is dedicated to awareness, support, education, and research related to Erdheim Chester disease. Deanna Fournier, Executive Director of the Histiocytosis Association, which is dedicated to raising awareness about all histiocytic disorders through educational and emotional support and funding of research to lead to better treatments and a cure. And Claudio Di Girolamo, President of the Histiocytosis Association of Canada, dedicated to helping Canadians affected by all types of histiocytosis. We are all honored to have the support of one another and the support of you. So thank you so much for being here today. And with that, we'd love to turn it over to our speaker, Alyssa Cabral, Certified Health Coach and Functional Nutrition Practitioner. We're excited for Alyssa's talk and hope you get so much out of it. Thanks, Alyssa. Over to you. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today to discuss the topic of nutrition and self-care with a rare disorder. I'm genuinely honored to have been invited to speak with this beautiful community. Everyone that I've had the pleasure of connecting with thus far and meeting in the organization has been so lovely and so passionate about what they do. And I can just tell that everyone works extremely hard to empower the mission here with Histiocytosis Organization. So I'll introduce myself briefly and then we'll get right into it. But just a brief background on myself. So I studied an array of health sciences extensively in my undergrad, which then led me to study at a nutrition school to become a certified health coach. And I've also studied uh, functional nutrition. So I'm a certified functional nutrition counselor and I teach post-grad courses at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And I work with clients primarily with chronic illness. So on a personal note, I've been dealing with health struggles since I was a little girl. I dealt with serious reoccurring infections and chronic stomach issues as a child, and I was really unwell through my teens, but I always thought that that was just, um, oh, the sun just went down. <laughs> I always thought that that was really just um, how, how everyone felt. I didn't know anything different. So um, it really wasn't until my early 20s that I started exploring what was actually going on in my body. And through that time, I was diagnosed with a slew of chronic disorders. So some of them being hypothyroidism, PCOS, chronic neuropathy, um, ulcerative colitis, anxiety, depression, primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is an autoimmune disease of the liver, and with that said, I am grateful and lucky to say that at 30 years old, thanks to my amazing medical team and the lifestyle modalities that I've prioritized, although there's no cure for my rare disease, I am thriving with my chronic disorders. Um, and like anyone with 
uh, rare disease. I still have my bad days <laughs> along with my good. Um, and I'm still aware of my um, chronic disease state. But that being said, I have a much higher quality of life and I have um, more good days than bad. So monumental compared to what it was even just a handful of years ago. Um, the things that I implement into my wellness routine are not a cure to any of my ailments, but they do offer that higher quality of life and they increase my life expectancy. So some of the lifestyle modalities that give me higher quality of life and allow me to feel my best in my body day to day are those that surround nutrition, movement, mindset, and self-care. Um, and it's now my passion to share what I've learned with others in the hopes that we can find what works best in your own unique body, adding quality and strength to your every day as both patients and caregivers. Now, I do also want to just acknowledge that we have a really diverse group of individuals on the call today all from different walks of life, all from the wonderful Histio community, of course. We have patients, caregivers, friends, family, physicians, specialists, and so on. Um, so with the understanding that we're all on various paths, with varying amounts of nutrition uh, knowledge previous to what we'll go over today, it's really my intention to cover material that will be valuable across the board. Um, and it can sometimes be challenging to pinpoint exactly what that should look like when speaking to a large group of individuals from different walks, different paths. Um, anything that I touch on today can certainly elaborate on by sending over educational materials that I have in my coaching arsenal, my nutrition coaching. Um, and I'm always happy to set up uh, a call um, and connect in various ways to be able to take a deeper dive into uh, more individualized support and answering your questions. So. At the end of the webinar, I'll be sure to share uh, more information on how to reach out for support, and I'll also be sending out an email with helpful resources on how to put into practice what we discussed today. All right. So just a quick disclaimer, I always have to put that disclaimer in. Um, so none of what we discussed today is medical advice, nor is it um, any tailored recommendation for one specific individual. So always apply what you learned here to the context of your body and your life. Um, I'm here to educate and inspire and encourage you to take the information that you learned today and apply it to the context of your own health uh, and the health of your loved ones. It's always a good idea to speak to your medical team before changing anything in your diet or lifestyle routines. And whenever I speak to nutrition, whether it's in my coaching or my personal life, I always start with the foundation, which is the concept of bioindividuality. And there's a lot of controversy within the wellness sector and the nutrition sphere when it comes to subscribing to specific dietary theories or wellness modalities. Every week I see on the news or social media claims about the next best superfood or the next best quick fix or weight loss fix. And the truth of it is that there is no one size fits all when it comes to nutrition. In fact, I like to say that there's it's a one size fits none and there is no fad diet out there that will sustain your health goals long term. So just some surface context here, um, your microbiome, which is the ecosystem of bacteria, fungi, and viruses in your gut, in your digestive tract, and on your body, um, for better or for worse, are unique to you. So they're like as unique as a fingerprint, right, as we have displayed on the screen here, um, to you and only you. And this alongside other cofactors such as ancestry, environment, toxic load, the state of your central nervous system, all play a huge role in what foods will best serve you as a unique individual throughout various seasons of your life, right? So that is subject to change as you progress and move forward on your path. So I like to compartmentalize nutrition variables into the conditionals and unconditionals. Um, meaning there are certain aspects of our nutrition that do ring true across the board, seeing um, or such as, you know, eating organic, fresh, whole foods. Um, those are going to nourish you and your cells well beyond eating highly processed packaged foods, right? So that we can use as a blanket statement, whereas saying something like everyone should eat three cups of grains a day. That's not a blanket recommendation that we want to make for every single person. 
In fact, many studies show that greens can actually increase inflammatory processes for those with autoimmune disorders. Um, now that's not to fear monger anyone away from eating greens if it works for you, but rather to just paint a better understanding and paint that bigger picture of including all of the details that surround your own unique needs um, and taking into consideration the nuances of our personal health histories, um, which is where the benefit comes into really working with a nutrition professional. So for this reason, I always incorporate a food journal as part of my coaching programs with clients. And it's one of the few tools that allows us to identify what foods are working for them and which aren't. Um, that said, in a workshop setting like this, it is a little bit more uh, difficult to speak to um, as a, a general group, not focusing on, in on any one case, um, but I find it helpful to dive right into those unconditionals, um, or in other words, the variables that ring true for all of us. So in addition to that, we'll speak to helpful nutrition resources specific to the diagnosis of a histiocytic disorder as well. All right, so eating real food and what I term as crowding out. So let's start with some of the basics here. Nutrition really doesn't have to be complicated. Um, there is a lot of information out there and a lot of styles of eating, but at the end of the day, it's just about eating high quality balanced meals. Um, that's going to be the biggest thing to focus on. Um, so I'd like to now dive into eating real food and um, a practice that I refer to as crowding out. So the basis of clean eating um, is really consuming primarily whole unprocessed foods, essentially foods that come from the earth and haven't been tainted by man-made processes. So I encourage eating whole foods um, I encourage eating a whole foods diet because consuming foods in their whole form doesn't, um, it doesn't only eliminate the harmful ingredients that we find in a majority of our foods on the shelf, but it also offers us the most nutrient density um, and the anti-inflammatory benefits for our bodies to thrive at a cellular level. So what's the point of eating this way? Um, instead of yo-yo dieting, which we see a lot of in the nutrition field, um, or subscribing to those fads that we talked about, eating a whole foods diet is based on sustainable lifestyle shifts. It keeps it simple and removes extreme restrictions that you might find in other diet plans. So it allows you to remove harmful ingredients from your diet while also eating enough and eating a variety of foods. And it helps you to reduce your exposure to chemicals, hormones, and highly processed ingredients. So one way to encourage whole food eating in your diet is to experiment with home cooking, right? Home cooked meals are of course best, and we'll be sending out, um, I sent something over, so we'll go out in the email blast after the webinar, um, and it's essentially going to include my recipe guide. So you can check that out for plenty of ideas on where to get started with that. I also highly recommend um, two different cookbooks, actually. So one of them being the autoimmune uh, paleo diet cookbook, um, and the other one being the um, Whole30 cookbook. So both of those cookbooks offer amazing, um, delicious recipe ideas for how to start really building your meals around whole foods. And inevitably, um, what happens is the more whole foods that you put into your plate um, and into your meals, authentically, those other things that you were fueling yourself with throughout the day, um, you're not gonna be as hungry for it, right? Because you're, you're filling up on those whole foods. So you'll be crowding those out. Um, so those are two books that are really great. I have those sitting right in my kitchen. <laughs> um, and eating a, a whole foods nourishing diet does also mean uh, cutting back or eliminating refined sugars, um, uh, refined carbohydrates. And I think most of us are, are uh, pretty aware of what's, what's a, considered a refined or an unhealthy carb, so like sugars and breads. Um, that said, I never promote a totally restrictive diet. There is a framework in the area of nutrition called the 80-10 rule, um, 80-20. <laughs> um, and it's really the understanding that what you do 80% of the time is going to greatly outweigh what you're doing or indulging in 20% of the time. And this ratio will look different for everyone and that's okay. It, it should look different for everyone. Um, the idea is really to empower yourself with information and be able to introduce better options into your diet. 
which will, again, authentically crowd out the less nutritious treats that um, you have from time to time. So especially with the kids, um, you really want to be able to let them feel like kids and enjoy the treats, um, especially with their friends at times. And the good news is there's alternatives for almost everything today. So for example, instead of giving my nieces the ice pops that I grew up on, which were full of uh, corn syrup and dyes, <laughs> I'll get them ice pops made from 100% organic real fruit juice with no additives. Um, and there's so many healthy swaps like that. We'll actually go over a few more as we move along. Um, but something that will really help you and your loved ones stay on track with choosing better options and maintaining consistent eating times um, uh, is maintaining consistent eating times and trying not to skip meals unless you have a medical reason to do so, of course. Um, keeping your blood sugar stable greatly contributes to healthy food choices. When you wait too long between meals and eat processed foods that spike your blood sugar, it leads to an energy crash, right? So you go up and then you come right back down and you're more likely to reach for foods like refined sugars, rancid fats, caffeines in an attempt to up your energy again. Um, and if you continue that cycle of those highs and lows, you're going to feel irritable, you're going to feel exhausted. And um, by eating the whole foods every few hours, you you avoid those shifts in your blood sugar. And in addition to that, um, having stable blood sugar regulation actually helps with inflammation. So it helps to reduce inflammation in the body. Um, and in addition, when we skip meals, our stress hormones go up as well. And when they come back down, our stress hormones going up feel pretty good for a little bit, but when they come crashing back down, it leaves us feeling really sick. Um, so having these ups and downs throughout the day is definitely not our goal. We wanna be able to have that steady stream of energy and keep our moods um, stable as well. So a major factor of blood sugar stabilization is by balancing your plate with your macronutrients. So you should aim to get protein, carbohydrates, and fat at every meal. This will create optimal blood sugar levels, as well as save off those cravings for the type of, um, uh, it'll save off cravings and it'll save off any of those symptoms that you get. So whether it's brain fog or grogginess, um, uh, or anything that you might feel after meals, that bloated feeling. Um, some examples of great protein sources include grass-fed meats, fish, tempeh, and legumes. And optimal sources of fat can come from avocado, olive oils, um, nuts, seeds. And when reaching for complex carbs, you want to try to go for either um, whole grains if they work for you, like farro or brown rice, buckwheat, and then vegetables like sweet potatoes, Brussels sprouts, artichoke, um, depending on what feels good for you. We often say in the nutrition space, eat the rainbow, and that just means getting more variety of colors on your plate, um, more of a variety of nutrients will come with that. Um, and so it's always nice to have the more variety in, in your diet, the better, the better for you. Um, so you can get vitamins from supplements as well, <laughs> yes, and that's totally fine in the appropriate context, but um, nutrition nutrients really have a lot more value um, when they come from food because it's more bioavailable that way, so it's more readily absorbed in its whole package. Um, and if you've ever heard the saying, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything, um, you know, if you take care of yourself and you eat balanced, and you have these stable moods and you have this stable energy, you'll, you'll find it easier to engage in uh, more things that serve you, right? Um, and, and keep you fueled in other ways, so such as self-care, movement, meditation, other techniques that increase your quality of life, right? So, because um, when you're when you start to feel better in your own body um, because you're feeling it appropriately, you have more physical and mental bandwidth um, to really put towards um, those other areas of nourishment and to motivate and support your body in other ways. So of course, we all have chronic illness here. Um, and I know that with a chronic disorder, um, I understand that it can make implementing these changes seem even more difficult or daunting, um, but the point isn't to be perfect, it's to do what you can and modify your routines to what suits your body throughout, again, those various seasons of life. Um, nothing is permanent and what works for you now isn't going to work for you a month from now. What you have to restrict now doesn't mean you're going to have to restrict six months from now. And I really like to point that out because 
I've had people tell me to do all kinds of workouts and therapies when I couldn't even walk from one room to the next. And um, that kind of advice can be a little frustrating, especially when unsolicited. But um, in general, you know, you want to really feel understood for what works best for your in your body. Um, so that said, I do encourage you to empower yourself and to really tune into your body and make those small changes that are attainable for you right now um, and your loved ones, because those small changes that you make over time really blossom into colossal improvements overall. So. Uh, on a last note here, I do have a Whole Foods A to C guide for clients and it breaks down the full nutrition panel of each whole food. It goes into the macro and micronutrients um, and really what body systems are you honoring when you're eating those foods. So I'll, I'll make sure that that's attached to that email blast after the webinar as well. All right, so inevitably life is imperfect and we will consume some packaged foods or slightly processed foods at times and that's completely okay. The biggest thing to be conscious of is really empowering yourself with knowledge and reading food labels. So don't buy into the marketing ploys that say on the front of the package things like heart healthy, all natural, low fat, low calorie pack. Those don't actually really mean anything. There's zero regulations on those statements. Um, and they fail to tell you that the low fat means it's just replaced with a bunch of other harmful ingredients to keep it hyper palatable and profitable. So instead, we don't wanna look at the front of the package. We wanna turn it over and we wanna look at that ingredients label. Um, so that's the part of the package where they have to be mostly transparent. Um, they still use terms like natural flavors, which could actually mean a lot of things, but that's why we wanna look at the labels that keep it simple and uh, there's few ingredients. The less ingredients, the better. So if you can't pronounce it, you don't want to consume it on a regular basis. Um, the fun part about this is that the more that you do this at the grocery store, the more that you realize that there are really yummy health alternatives here. Um, so especially if you have kiddos, it's nice to be able to keep, you know, cookies and snacks in the pantry and know that it's not only honoring them, you know, in that sort of uh emotional way, right, where they feel like they can be normal, but it's also honoring their body at the same time. So I'll actually dive into an example right now. This is what we call a smart swap. So sort of piggybacking on alternative options for common snacks. These ingredient labels for these cookies are night and day. So this is just one example of many, uh, especially when it comes to kids, but you know, us adults too. Uh, but we really don't want to, I think uh, making these changes for kids can feel especially daunting because that's sort of their time to be able to have treats with friends and you know, be in these social settings. Um, nourishing our bodies and nourishing our our souls and our relationships and having these experiences are all very important but we also want to be able to give our body and serve our body what we need um especially when we're healing so so these are so there's so many options out there um this is just one this is actually the simple mills brand on the left of the screen they have so many amazing products my family eats me out of house and they don't even half of them don't even eat very well at very healthy um they have no idea that they're healthier and they all love it so that's how i know it's a really great spot up. I do have, um, for time purposes, I'm going to leave it at that, um, but I do have a smart swap list where it shows you, okay, so if you wanted a cookie or if you wanted a cake or if you wanted ice cream, here's a better option for that. And this way you don't have to spend so much time navigating in the grocery store. It gives you some knowledge there. All right, so let's talk a little bit about chemotherapy treatment related to nutrition. So chemotherapy symptoms may include dry mouth, taste change, nausea, fatigue, which can really make eating seem like more of a chore. Um, and on top of that, many histio patients do experience swallowing issues, um, which just adds on, adds some additional challenges surrounding proper nutrition consumption. But the good news is there are helpful ways to intake the proper amount of calories and nutrition regardless of these side effects. And these options are important because, of course, it's essential to eat a healthy, balanced diet during cancer treatment in order to keep your body functioning optimally, right, for those healing processes. So foods that are more mild in flavor, easy on your stomach, and nutrient dense are some of the best options. Getting enough protein can really help yourself or your child heal faster from the side effects of radiation and chemotherapy while also helping to prevent infections. So like cheese, eggs, milk, yogurt, lean meats, poultry, fish, beans, peanut butter, nuts, lentils, soy, all great sources of protein. And then of course, 
protein powders are um, very helpful for ensuring the consumption of adequate levels while making it easier to consume in an easy to ingest uh, way. So such as having a smoothie or mixing a protein powder in water or milk or juice. Um, you could even have uh, MCT oil or a coconut oil blend, um, add that to juice and add a scoop of unflavored collagen if you need an all liquid balanced meal. So the MCT or a coconut oil, the MCT doesn't have any flavor. So um, I go with that oftentimes. Um, it's medium chain triglycerides, which is that active component in coconut oil that's really good for us, um, but is probably more palatable to do in a mixture like that. So that would be the healthy fat for you. Um, the juice would be the carb, of course, and the minerals, and the collagen powder would be the protein. Um, Oatmeal. Oatmeal provides numerous nutrients that can help our bodies during chemotherapy. So I love using oatmeal. It's a quick, easy to digest, balanced meal. Um, it boasts ample amounts of carbs, proteins, antioxidants, as well as more healthy fats than most grains that you find. Um, and you can make it so many different ways. It's really versatile, which keeps it fun and adds diversity to your diet. It also helps regulate your bowels um, because of something called beta-glucan in there. It's a type of soluble fi fiber that feeds the good bacteria in your gut. Um, and it's helpful to counteract any stomach upset for that reason. So things like constipation and diarrhea that you might um, experience as side effects of treatment. So on another note, oatmeal's neutral flavor and that creamy soft texture especially is advantageous if you're experiencing common keto side effects like dry mouth and mouth sores. So um, an extra bonus is that you can make what we call overnight oats, um, and you can take those on the, on the go to your doctor's appointments. It's super easy. You just soak oats and whatever milk of preference that you have, put in the refrigerator overnight, and you're done. In the morning, you can top it with fun things to change it up and keep it diverse. Um, so whether it's berries or honey, nuts, fruit, maple syrup, those are common add-ins. Um, or if you want to make it savory, you could do avocados or eggs. Um, and of course, if you're um, on more of a bland diet, you could just eat it plain, maybe put a dash of salt in there. Um, if you're experiencing or your loved ones are experiencing nausea, mouth sores, and just want something very simple to eat. So when I make overnight oats, I like to use a mason jar for this. It's a non-toxic storage method, easy to travel, and it makes it more fun in my opinion. <laughs> so bone broth, bone broth is another one. Bone broth is a great option in general, but essentially when primarily um, nourishing with liquids. So um, if you're really trying to, if you're looking primarily for hydration or you're just on an all liquid diet for a period of time, the reason for this is because it not only allows you to consume additional calories um, versus you know just drinking water but bone broth is extremely rich in minerals and compounds such as glycine and gelatin which promote a healthy digestive tract um, and help you assimilate more of the nutrients that you consume and also promote a healthy immune system. So bone broth is high in protein, which is another helpful and easy way to meet your daily needs, which according to the Mayo Clinic is about um, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. But just know that that's an umbrella recommendation as I you know, uh, have been trending uh, with, with what I've been telling you. Um, everything is sort of just an overarching general recommendation and then you always find what works best for you. Um, in addition to these benefits, we know that, um, especially because there are taste changes, uh, that's really normal during chemotherapy, and water is commonly said to taste different um, when you're going through those treatments. So broth is a really great alternative to keep you hydrated. Um, it's made by simmering water with vegetables and herbs and poultry and bones if you want to do it that way. Um, and during that process, electrolytes are released into the fluid and these charged particles, which include nutrients like sodium and potassium, chloride and calcium, um, they help keep your body functioning optimally. So sipping on broth can be helpful if you're uh, losing a lot of electrolytes, uh, which often happens or which absolutely happens when we're vomiting or sweating a lot or have diarrhea. Um, and if you have the appetite for it, you can, you know, you can have whatever you want, chicken, tofu, veggies, uh, puree it if you actually make this as a soup and puree it and drink it that way. Um, if you have mouth sores or swallowing issues, um, 
that can be really helpful too, just to get that nutrition in. Um, I'm, I just also want to say that I'm sorry if I'm making like a lot of mouth noises or I sound really nasally. I'm getting over a virus right now. So um, I should have said that at, in the get-go. Um, but added nutrients, especially when you're experiencing dry mouth or low appetite, um, you can, what you could do for added nutrients is you can add a heap of flavorless protein, um, such as collagen powder into the broth and um, you can mix it in there. It's really simple if you're experiencing nausea or vomiting to just sip it slowly. Um, broth is great in these instances as it lacks fiber, which makes it a lot easier to digest. Um, homemade smoothies are a great option if you're having a hard time chewing solid food, right? So being able to, um, or you're having time, having a hard time with those swallowing issues. Uh, so you want to get enough nutrients in, you can really jam pack those smoothies and just slip, sip those slowly throughout the day. Um, and they're of course highly customizable. So there's so many different options um, of how you could put together a smoothie. Um, and you just want to really focus in on those macronutrients. If you want any smoothie recipes, you can always reach out to me through email as well. And there's a ton online. Um, adding avocados to smoothies can also be really helpful. Um, they're extremely nutrient dense. It gives you more calories to get in if you're having a hard time getting in enough calories. It's high in fat, good fats. Um, and, you know, it's it's um, very versatile. It's it's more mild. Um, so it's a great option if you're experiencing, like, you just, you don't really, you have a lack of an appetite. Um, everything tastes a little funky to you. Um, it's very mild and you're able to get in a lot of nutrition that way. Nut butters are also um, great to, to put in those smoothies for you as well. Um, so let's see, so we went into vitamins and minerals, staying hydrated. Let me just make sure I covered everything here. Um, all right, so let's move on. Um, I also just wanna say that um, kids being treated for cancer often lose a lot of water, like we said, from vomiting and diarrhea um, and not drinking enough, which can clearly lead to dehydration. So we all know that water is really important, but um, you know, water, and being hydrated really impacts every single function in our body, right? So this is really the foundation. Um, so we want to make sure that we're focusing on hydration. So pure fruit juices are great for kids going through treatments because they're more inclined to get that down versus the water alone. Um, and it also has calories and minerals attached. There are a lot of minerals in fruit juices. Um, so that's definitely a bonus. A great way to get in those electrolytes and make water more fun for your kids is by adding mineral packs. So they actually have mineral packs specifically for kids, formulated for them. Um, and they have flavors like fruit punch um, and fun, really palatable, um, tasty flavors for the kids. There's a brand called uh, Path MD. Trace Minerals has a kid's brand as well, but just always consult your doctor first. Um, and another one that you can inquire about would be Mary Ruth's Organic Supplements for Kids. Amazing, extremely high quality supplements. Um, there's also something called Full Script, which is a website you can look into where all of the supplements, you have to order them through a practitioner like myself, but all of the supplements are lab tested, which is very rare in the United States. Unfortunately, supplements are not regulated in the US. Um, and so I always go through full script for my clients. All right, if you find that you or your loved ones are in a season of needing a convenient liquid nutrition that covers all daily nutrient needs, I would highly suggest taking a look at these two brands versus the popular uh, brands out there um, that unfortunately contain less than optimal ingredients. So I love Kate Farms liquid nutrition. Her shakes are definitely my number one choice, but Orgain, um, their organic nutrition shake is really great as well. They're both they're both great brands, 100% organic ingredients. Um, and another thing to consider would be something called Elemental Heal, um, which I'll show you on the next slide here. So Elemental Heal is a clinically researched and scientifically validated complete meal replacement. Elemental Heal was formulated by Dr. Ruccio and contains all necessary macro, micro, and mineral needs for patients. So you can talk to your doctor about using this if you're on all liquids and you want that full nutritional panel. Even if you aren't, it's a great powerhouse of nutrition to add to smoothies or use as a multivitamin protein powder um, in various meals, um, which is really easy to absorb and can help you conquer any of the deficiencies 
issues that you might have. And uh, I actually have been on an Elemental Heal quite a few times. I and this is not me making any claims for anyone else's situation, but I have talked to my gastroenterologist at times before when I was in a flare, and instead of putting me on a um, steroid, I was able to sort of stave off having to go on a steroid and was able to just implement the elemental heal protocol here for a week or so and was able to avoid that. And then, of course, uh, there's a time and place for everything, and I've been on steroids as well. <laughs> But uh, this is a great this is a great option for sort of multi-purpose uses, and those are some of them. So something to take into consideration. It's great because it's a way to give your digestive tract a break while simultaneously giving your body everything that it needs. And I just want to touch on really um, your environment and mindset when eating. So oftentimes in the nutrition space, I hear the phrase, you are what you eat, but in reality, you are what your body breaks down and absorbs, assimilates and utilizes from what you eat. So proper digestion is key to proper nutrition. Our nervous system plays a huge role in how our bodies adequately function throughout our days and our lives. So that said, when eating, we want to shift our fight or flight sympathetic state of our nervous system where we find ourselves in the hustle and bustle of our days. And we really wanna move ourselves into that parasympathetic uh, rest and digest stage. So some ways that we can get our bodies over to the rest and digest sympathetic state for meal times is by sitting down without our phones or devices or any technological distractions. We encourage sharing meals with those who you enjoy being in the company with and really valuing friends and family, sharing and spoken gratitude before a meal, whether it be prayer or otherwise, which always, um, which allows us to really bring ourselves into that present moment and connect with the gift of sitting there for each meal. When we do this, it does switch over into our relaxed digestive mode. So what we're really looking for here is to change our environment uh, when eating and to really change that physiological and mental state during mealtime. So things we want to be aware of are our breath. Few of us really pay attention to our breath, but it is intimately connected to our body, uh, to our mood, to our emotions. So picture this. Before you begin eating, you take a moment to take a full breath, gently and slow. Bring yourself to your body, sitting there at the table, being committed to being nowhere else, and breathing with the intention of relaxing and becoming fully present. This is by far the fastest way to shift our bodies into a more relaxed state. We also want to set the intention of slowing down before a meal. So imagine shifting your body from 100 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour just bringing it down to an easy coast. So many of us are racing through our lives, <laughs> wasting through our days. Um, and if we slow down more by sitting down to eat, by being realistic about how much time we have to accomplish things in the day, by really focusing on one task at a time instead of five, um, we can shift our body out of that fight or flight and into that rest or digest mode and find that we digest our foods much better. Life happens so fast, we need to take time to relax and enjoy the process. There's no good reason to move so fast that we can't metabolize our meals. So health is not about speed. It really is health and healing is very much about slowing down, enjoying your food. When we focus on enjoying our food, we activate our pleasure receptors. We tune into our senses, taste, touch, smell. They're all initiated and this also has a positive impact on, on um, impacting and turning on that parasympathetic mode. So you may have noticed that none of the above suggestions are purely focused on food. What we can uh, or what we do eat certainly has an impact on our digestive wellness, but it's not the whole story. Digestive wellness and nutrition healing is much more than just the food and supplements that we ingest. Um, adding awareness and implementing these actions will allow you to get the most benefit from your food. And so I'm just going to really brief this slide very much just to put the awareness out there. But for time purposes, I'm not going to take too much of a deep dive into these. Uh, there are a few elimination uh, diet plans out there that can be really helpful through seasons of our healing. And so what a couple of those look like, I mean, you can refer to your uh, doctor or your dietitian um, that uh, your gastroenterologist may have referred you to um, might um, you might benefit from these diets during certain areas um, and times of your path. So the neutropenic diet is one of them, and it does um, it is really 
built and directed towards uh, those with a low immunity. So especially if you're going through treatments, it's there to show you how to eat to really protect you. Um, so for example, if you were going to add honey to those overnight oats, you'd want to make sure it was pasteurized, right? You, you don't want to get an unpasteurized or a raw honey. So those are very much the things that that diet surrounds. The bland diet, of course, um, which is going to help you if you're um, you know, going through loss of appetite or changes in taste, nausea, diarrhea, things like that. So you might want to look into that. Um, again, this is on the um, this is on the MSK website. So mskcc.org slash experience, or you could do slash nutrition cancer diet plans. Um, and uh, that'll be a great resource for you to look into these. Clear liquid diet, which we briefed on, which is pretty self-explanatory, and the low fiber diet. Um, a lot of times going through cancer treatments is going to affect your digestive tract, and you're not gonna be able to break down more of those fibrous foods. So this is really gonna help give you more of an outline and a guide um, if you wanted to use that as guidance. Those of us with chronic disorders are already under a lot of physiological uh, stress. So providing the body the building blocks that it needs can help to reduce the stress. So your body doesn't have to work so hard. It doesn't have to focus so much in other places where you have those deficiencies and instead it could focus on healing and repairing. So the most common vitamin and mineral deficiencies in the U.S. include vitamin D, B6, folic acid, magnesium, and zinc. And it's helpful to understand what the deficiencies are most common within your disease community and speak to your healthcare providers about how you can monitor, test, and support these areas of potential deficit. Vitamin D is very common as a deficiency within the histiopatient community. So as we know, we get our vitamin D from the sun. And unfortunately, when we as patients go through treatment, we can become intolerant to the sun for a period of time. We know that vitamin D is an important hormone that regulates our digestive system, absorbs calcium and phosphorus, and that it's necess a necessary nutrient for human health and overall immunity. Um, the Institute for Medicine has determined that the recommended dietary allowance for vitamin D is 1,000 to 2,000 IUs or international units per day. Um, that is for the general population. This is really where testing is important and comes into play. So we have ranges here that show where it's low, where it's in good range, and where it's high, which your doctor can go over with you. Um, and what you could do is you could ask your doctor for a simple blood test just to check your levels so you know how to supplement. And you can change that during different seasons of the year of course if you are um, even if you're protecting your skin from the sun if you if you are um, still exposed a bit um, you might have some higher levels there um, and levels that are too high too this is important can be just as destructive as levels that are too low so um, that said when you are deficient there are alternative ways um, to increase vitamin d levels in lieu of sun exposure and the reason why I really drive home that um, high levels can be just as destructive as low levels is because a lot of times we're sort of supplementing blindly. Um, and so, you know, you don't know where your levels are and you could be over supplementing. So just something to consider, um, especially because vitamin D can uh, at too high levels can cause cal calcification in the body. But um, before I dive into the methods, I want to go into the alternative methods if you can't get yourself in the sun right now. But I just want to really touch quick on self-advocacy um, and then we'll go into methods on the next slide. So in terms of self-advocacy, some helpful ways to advocate for yourself are by arming yourself with information. I wouldn't just rely on your doctor to tell you everything. I personally get second and third opinions. I do my own research. I ask questions. Um, in addition, your doctor sees uh, when your doctor sees that you're doing that, that you're doing your due diligence and understand your disease, um, they'll be much more receptive to investigate additional testing um, and really work in a partnership with you. Um, it can be helpful to write down your questions before your appointment and bring them with you. Appointments can be really overwhelming. I always put notes in my phone, um, in the notes section of my phone, and I bring them with me so I can be prepared. Staying organized and keeping on top of your health records on file um, can be really valuable. I often revisit my old labs for reference, and you really want to stay in tune with your body. I had a conversation with my hepatologist recently um, because I was feeling extremely fatigued, um, and I was just having a few um, sort of symptoms that were a little outside the box for me, and um, he was running a bunch of diagnostics, and essentially I just said, I think my iron's low. 
I really, I just intuitively feel like my iron's low, plus I know what low iron feels like. Um, can you check for my iron? And lo and behold, my iron was dangerously low and I ended up um, needing infusions. So, you know, there's no hurt in asking and exploring these things um, because a lot of times your doctor, they're gathering information and they're trying to figure out what it is and it takes some trial and error for them. So if you're in tune and you're educated and you wanna be able to work in partnership with your doctor, it should that's exactly how it should be. Um, so they should be very receptive to that. Make sure that you have doctors that support you in that way. Okay, so there are few foods that are naturally rich in vitamin D3. Um, the best sources are gonna be uh, fatty, fleshy uh, fish, um, fish liver oils, smaller amounts uh, are also found in egg yolks or cheese, beef liver, uh, mushrooms contain vitamin D. Um, many foods and supplements are fortified with vitamin D, so that would be in a lot of our dairy products, um, fortified cereals, um, things like that, fortified orange juice. So uh, that's another way to get a little bit of extra vitamin D into your system. In addition to improving your vitamin D levels with food, you may also choose to incorporate a high quality supplement into your routine. So the best type of oral vitamin D is liquid. Um, and it's meant to be used sublingually, which means under the tongue. And it is readily used by the body. It's more bioavailable when you do it that way. And um, what that means is that it's able to bypass the digestive tract and going through the breakdown um, of that digestion there. And instead, it goes right into your bloodstream. So. Another characteristic that you want to find in your D3 supplement is that it's paired with a K2. So I know I touched very briefly earlier about calcification issues with really high vitamin D. It's kind of hard to get there um, unless you're really willy-nilly um, supplementing, but um, your K2 levels are just as important. And so I really like when the supplement has that balanced ratio of D3 and K2 already um, so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, that process. So both that you see on the screen, the Thorn and the Organic Mary Ruth's are brands that I personally use. You can ask your doctor if he, he or she has any recommendations. Um, and you always want to ensure that your um, that your, your your brands are high quality, which is why again I go through full script and why I like to share some of the um, some of the brands that I, I use here. And then lastly, there are some great vitamin D topical therapies that can help you add a little extra vitamin D to your routine as well. So I take the Now cream that you see on the screen and I'll rub it on my wrists or I'll rub it on the bottom of my feet um, because it is more readily absorbed in those areas of the skin. So that's just, I just do that if my D levels are really low just for an extra little boost there. So for this slide, I'm actually going to just send out a resource going over budget. I think it'll actually serve you a lot better, be more comprehensive, and you can keep it on hand. And for time purposes, um, uh, I think that's going to probably be a best option. So be on the lookout for my budget guide when it comes to grocery shopping. So although the food aspect of nutrition is important for health, so too are other areas of our life that nourish us, such as our relationships, um, movement, spirituality. And in the functional nutrition space, we call these primary foods. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm going to actually go right into self-care in terms of primary foods. Having a chronic health condition or being the caregiver of someone with a chronic health condition can feel like a full-time job and it can even sometimes feel through certain seasons of life like our days uh, really revolve solely around that reality. So it's really important that we prioritize forms of self-care in our days, even if it means carving out 20 minutes before we go to bed or 20 minutes at the start of your day. Self-care should really be a non-negotiable as, as it is part of the healing process. So self-care is really any activity that nurtures and and refuels us. The definition for self-care is multifaceted. Each of us have many sides that make us whole, whether it be in our physical body, our relationship to self, our emotional and mental state, our spiritual beliefs, or work. Um, these are often unique spaces for self-care attention. Um, so for time purposes, I'm going to kind of zip through this. Um, you know, I'll, actually, I have a list of various types of self-care opportunities within each of those phases that I can send over to you. Um, but let me just say, um, to just give a little more context here, 
The key to self-care is to identify with areas of your life that need attention and engage in activities that support you on a regular basis. Um, so you may find that what works for you changes over time. Perhaps you recognize a need for connection at some point. So your daily exercise goes from solo runs to runs with a friend, right? So keep in mind that your participation in self-care will ebb and flow and the areas of your life that need more balance and shifting will change. So um, how self-care looks in your life may change drastically from one period to the next, but it's just important that the routine and the consistency, uh, the consistent effort of having a self-care routine is always present. So I'll go ahead and send you over more about self-care and how you can implement that into your schedules, even when they're a bit crazy and it feels impossible. Um, and I just want to thank you all so much for being here with me. Um, you have a wonderful community with a ton of heart-centered leadership behind you, and it's such an honor to be able to share with all of you today. I hope that you did find value in the information that I have uh, and you have a few takeaways today from the webinar, I'm happy to connect and support you and answer questions that come up for you related to any areas of lifestyle well-being. So please don't hesitate to reach out. I know we're on kind of a time limit now, but if you need elaboration on anything at all, you can always send me an email and I look forward to connecting with the Histio community more as time progresses on. And I hope you have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much for your time today. We hope that you truly enjoyed the talk. Here are some additional resources focused on ECD with the Erdheim Chester Disease Global Alliance. You can find information on their website. They also have a registry that you can enroll in if you are diagnosed with ECD. So we encourage you to check out the ECD Global Alliance website and learn more about all the amazing programs that they offer. For other Histio resources, you can visit histio.org or for the Histio Association of Canada, histio.ca. And on both sites, you can learn more about disease information, any research initiatives, or any of the other programs that are available. We are all also on social media, so we hope that you find us there. We also encourage you to join our next webinar, which is Beyond the Office Visit Part 3, Moving Through Rare Disease, on Tuesday, May 3rd from 2 to 3 p.m. We're really excited about this one. It is focused on movement and exercise. If you're tuning in after and are watching the recording, you can find the video on our YouTube pages or on our websites. And we would love to hear thoughts of other webinars that you're interested in. We're always open to new ideas so that we can bring you the information that you need most. And finally, contact information for your, your speaker and your host today. Alyssa has generously offered her contact information if you have any specific questions for Alyssa. If you'd like to reach out to the ECD Global Alliance, the Histiocytosis Association of Canada, or the Histiocytosis Association, you can email all of us right here um, through those emails on the screen. Thank you all so much for attending and we're thrilled to be able to partner together to offer you educational webinars just like this. So um, please reach out, watch the recordings, request the handouts, share ideas, and uh, we look forward to continuing to partner with you and to see you on future webinars. Have a wonderful rest of your day.